I'm John Perkins, and I'm a former economic hitman. What we economic hitmen did essentially was to create the world's first truly global empire. I was recruited by the NSA uh, while I was uh, attending Boston University back in the 60s. Uh, they put me through a series of tests, including lie detector tests, uh, psychological tests. And in that process, uh, they determined that I had the potential for being a good uh, economic hitman. They also discovered a number of weaknesses in my character that would make it fairly easy for them to hook me into doing this job. And so they, they offered me uh, a job as a trainee. And it's interesting, you know, when you, when you accept a job like that with the NSA, they don't tell you exactly what you're going to be doing. They tell you that for the next year or so, you're going to be training. And then at the end of that period of time, they'll really determine what you're going to be doing. But ultimately, I ended up becoming an economic hitman. We did it by using many different means, but perhaps the most common was to identify a third world country with resources that our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from an organization like the World Bank or one of its sisters. But that country never actually received the money. Instead, the money went to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country, like power plants and industrial parks, things that would help the very rich people in that country, as well as our own corporations, but not the majority of the people who are too poor to buy electricity or don't have the skills to get jobs in industrial parks. And yet they, the whole country, would end up ho holding a huge debt, such a big debt that they couldn't possibly repay it. When I lose, I pay, and when I win, I expect to get paid. I don't ask anybody to trust me, and I don't trust anybody. Big shot or penny anti chiseler. But I tell you, I haven't got it. If I had, I'd give it to you. Now, don't be like that, Blackie. Give me a couple of days and... So at some point, we economic hitmen go back and say, listen, you owe us a lot of money, can't pay your debts, sell us your oil real cheaply, or vote with us on the next critical UN vote, or send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iraq. And in that way, we've created this empire. On the few occasions when we economic hitmen fail, the jackals go in. And these are people who will overthrow governments or assassinate the leaders of the countries that didn't accept the loans. I failed as an economic hitman with Jaime Roldos, the president of Ecuador, and Omar Torrijos of Panama. And because I failed to corrupt them, failed to bring them around, failed to get them to take on these loans that were so destructive to their countries, they were both assassinated by CIA-supported jackals. The words economic hitman and jackal are kind of tongue-in-cheek words. We, we use them. Uh, but it's like the word spy or, or snoop or um, spook or even CIA agent. Uh, people don't really use any of those terms. If you're a true CIA agent, spy, uh, you may talk about it tongue in cheek, but, but you've got a fancier title like uh, uh, attache, commercial attache at some embassy. Uh, we economic hitmen all had fancy titles too. My title was chief economist. But we would use this term, economic hitman, tongue-in-cheek. And the jackals, uh, usually people who work for private, what they call security firms, or a company that will have a semi-legitimate contract with some branch of the government to do something such as protect our personnel in an embassy overseas or maybe protect a media crew overseas, and, and they'll be paid to do that. But there'll be one person uh, in that organization whose money's coming through these other channels Sometimes the channels are what they call the black box money is from the CIA. The money coming through these channels for, to hire this one person who is essentially an assassin. On the few occasions when the jackals and the economic hitmen both fail, then we send in the military. When you have an empire, you have to ask yourself, who's the emperor? Well, an emperor is someone who's not elected and doesn't serve a limited term and doesn't report to anyone. We do have a group of people that I call the corporatocracy, which are the people who run our biggest corporations, who do fit that definition. They're not elected, they don't serve a limited term, and they don't report to anyone. They like to say they report to their boards of directors, but they're all on each other's boards of directors, and they, the boards of directors basically rubber stamp what the CEO wants to do. So this is the modern equivalent of the emperor. They're all driven by one single motive, one goal, and that is to maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. And in heading for that goal, they've created a world that's very dangerous, uh, very unfair, unsustainable, a world that I certainly don't want to pass on to my grandson.
is that the rule of law requires, the defining attribute of it is that nobody is above the law or nobody is below the law. And nobody means nobody. Nobody is above the law, nobody is below the law. And you can more interestingly look at literature from the 1980s and the 1990s. This was during the time when Western institutions, led by the United States, began lecturing the third world and the developing world about what it was that they had to do in order to comport with the rule of law. There were lots of journal articles written about what this term was supposed to mean, and the seminal article, the most influential article, was written by Thomas Carruthers who was an official at the World Bank. And in 1998, he published in the journal Foreign Affairs this article entitled The Requirements of the Rule of Law. It was intended to sermonize to third world countries what they had to do. And what he warned was that the way that you become a country not living under the rule of law, the hallmark of a country that fails to live under the rule of law, that is lawless, is that, quote, the ruling elite's tendency to act extra legally wherever legal systems remain captives of the powers that be. And he said that the most crucial challenge for a country that is lawless to become one that lives under the rule of law is that, quote, elites in the country must give up the habit of placing themselves above the law. That was the defining requirement. The idea that there is nobody above the law or below the law, that even when our highest ranking political officials get caught breaking the law, that they are subject to the same set of punishments and investigations and scrutiny and accountability as the most powerless American. But that is literally not a principle that we apply any longer to the leading members of our political class. The idea that people should be prosecuted when they commit crimes using the power that we vest with them in office is the idea that is considered radical and fringe, not the other way around. It's the immunity that is truly radical, but it's the idea that we should hold them accountable on equal terms that is now considered to be the extremist position. And the Emmy goes to You know, in, in essence, this is a story about a gangster, and gangsters are out there taking their kids to college, and taking their kids to school, and putting food on their table. And hell, let's face it, if the world and this nation was run by gangsters, maybe it is. <laughs> I'm on the border of Bolivia, working for pennies, treated like a slave, the poker fields have to be ready, the spirit of my people is starving, broken and sweaty, dreaming about revolution, looking at my machete, but the workload is too heavy to rise up in arms, and if I ran away, I know they'd probably murder my moms, so I pray to Jesucristo when I go to the mission, process the cocaine paste and play my position. Okay, listen, Juan Valdez, just get me my product before we chop off your hands, for workers' misconduct, I got the power to shoot a cop up, and not get charged and it would be sad to see your family in front of a firing squad so uh, feed your kids i need these bricks 40 tons in total let me test it indeed i shit this is good pass me a tissue and don't worry about them i paid off the official yo it don't come as a challenge i'm the son of some of the phallus elected by my people the only one on the ballot born and bred to consort with feds i laugh at fate and assassinate my predecessor to have his place in a third world fashion state lock the nation with 90 percent of the wealth 10% of the population, a central intelligence agency takes weight faithfully. The finest type of China, white and cocaine, you'll see. Honey, I'm home. Never mind when your bank account suddenly grown it. Funny, we're so out of this debt for this money we owe with ya. When have I told you that I had two governments overthrown to keep our son enrolled in a private school and to keep our tummy swollen? Come on, our fucking home was built in a foundation of bloody throats, the hungry stolen of their souls. Of course, this country's running coke. I took a stunning oath to hush the ones who know. The CIA conducts the flow for these young hustlers that lust for dough. Work in the hood, hit my connect. That's what's really good, and supply work to the hood. These dudes fucking crack me up, scrutinize like we inferior. Petrify when we meet in my area. My dude will shoot till I say so. You got the loot, give me the yay yay. Like ice cream, so don't play with my yay yo. We won't stop you, you bastards. My street spamless, chop it and bag it. Taking pictures and tapping phones, debating snitches and cracking codes. Fast the cup of last the fall on any hustler stacking dough. Just pump the cracker blow. And my overtime is where your taxes go. Again, you trust.